Good morning. Let's open up uh, the Bible to, we'll continue from last week in Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll read together from 8 through 16. Hebrews 11, 8 through 16, the epistle to the Hebrews chapter 11, from verse 8 through the end of 16. And I invite you, if you're able, to stand up and if you'd like to read out loud with me. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Let's pray. Father, we uh, love you and we thank you for today. We thank you that we get to come on the Lord's day to come together to worship you at this time, to come and exalt you and praise you. Lord, we pray as you look on us and you look at on us as a group, but also on each one of us as an individual, that you are pleased with the posture of our heart. And Lord, as we sang and as you have commanded us, you said, be holy for I am holy. And so Lord, we pray that we would come and surrender to you and, and allow you to do your work in us, to purify our hearts so that we can choose to be holy and allow you to strengthen us so that we can live that holy life that you've called us to. And help us, Lord, have our priorities right and to be set apart for you. And that we would walk in a manner that shows and proves that we are ready to do your will, that you are the chief in command, that you are the king on the throne, and we are here to report for duty. Lord, we pray that you minister to our hearts in this time through your word. And Lord, we thank you that we can come to you also with our needs. Lord, I pray for Brother George as he's going to have a surgery today, that you would be with him and be with the surgeon, and that you would hear about a, a successful operation and a good recovery. And Lord, we pray for Brother Akram and as he just had uh, some surgical procedures this past week and for healing and for his body to respond to the treatment. And we thank you for your help for Sister Ghazal and we pray that you'd give her strength for her fatigue that occurred from the treatment, Lord. And uh, we, uh, we praise you for your goodness and we thank you for caring about our every fine detail of our lives. And Lord, I pray for, every, for anybody who is here who has a sickness or is going through a tough trial that you would strengthen and empower. And also for those whom we love that we know that we would know to come and put them before you. And we await for a word from you today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. You may be seated. So last week... In the morning service, we started our talk about faith. What does that look like when we walk by faith? Uh, and, you know, we know we need to live by faith. But what does that mean intellectually in our mind? What does that mean practically as we live out? It may not be as obvious to us. 
And I pray that this doesn't become a series that we just like, oh yeah, nice, you know, an information that comes to our mind. But I pray that we walk out from the 10 people that we're going to talk through. And we covered one person last Sunday morning, and then we covered two on Sunday night, and I'll give a review of them. And then we'll try to cover at least one more person today in the morning. And I pray that we just look at it. What is it that practical act of faith that they were able to do that I can take in my life and I need to apply all 10 so that I can really be living by faith. And the title for today's message is Pioneers of the Faith. Pioneers of the Faith. Now, what's a pioneer? A pioneer usually is someone who's the first to do something. So they call people who discovered the land pioneers. Right? People who discovered America, they call them pioneers, right? And then, but there's pioneers of the faith. These are people, who, the things that they've done, not only is it living by faith, but they were the first to live that out, that they had no examples to look at, but we have them as examples. And that's why if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, it starts with a really beautiful verse. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, so here we have examples or not? Yes. A little bit or not? No, a lot. What, is, what does that look like? Just one glimpse of that is what? Chapter 11, which is the one that we're studying right now. And so the first person of faith that was a pioneer in the faith, and the first lesson that we learned was Abel. And the lesson from Abel is worship. He is the first one to do worship right on this earth. Prior to him, we've never seen Adam and Eve. We see that he walked, Adam walked with God, but there was no actual documentation of worship. We've seen that Cain also gave worship and he actually initiated. However, his worship, God did not respect. But when he looked at Abel's worship, he found that it is more excellent and it is worthy of God's respect and he loved it. And that's what we look, if we look at verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God what a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And that's the first lesson is, do we worship God or not? And I think it's going to be an automatic, yes, we do. We're here. It's not like there are people who are sleeping at home. There are people who don't want to come to church. And those are not worshiping. And so we are here on a Sunday. And yes, it's a good start. But Cain also worshiped. So the real question is, are we worshiping like Cain? We go through the motions, we come on a Sunday, or do we worship like Abel? And what was the difference between them? They both offered something to the Lord. However, one offered something that's respected by God, and one offered something that was not respected by God. The difference between them is the posture of the heart. The difference between them is that when they came to give, they, one put thought into it, and one kind of just put something together and threw it out before the Lord. Cain just said, oh, I work in the field, here's some stuff from the field. However, Abel, he got the firstborn, he got a fat, the fat one, which is the really good sacrifice of the animal sacrifice, and brought it to the Lord. And that is the real question. Do you and I really worship the Lord or not? And is it a more excellent type of worship or not? Meaning, do you and I and I want to talk about two types of worship. Do you and I, when we come to church, do you and I come, really, come with a well thought out posture? Lord, I'm coming to meet with you, with God's people. I'm coming to give you my heart's desire. I'm coming to give you my best. I am, it is a plan. It is the thing that I look forward to. I prepare the whole week to come meet you on Sunday, or it's, oh yeah, here it is. Stayed up late last night, just barely got up, and did whatever, and uh, here I am, okay, I just showed up. That is one way, but there's another way, it's like, and sometimes you still may end up in the same thing, you may stay up late because you were doing something for the Lord. But your intent was, Lord, I wanna, I wanna have energy when I'm in your presence, Lord, I want my mind to be sharp. I want my heart to be soft. Lord, I want to have been in your presence and I spend time with you. I'll ask it differently. What does it take to bring us here? 
and the times that we didn't come here, what was the reason? And would that really speak of a heart that really has the Lord, that we are giving Him our best and He is the first or not? There are good reasons to not be able to come here. Let's say, you know, God called you to go help somebody and it can only happen at this time, like an emergency, and you go and you do it unto the Lord. That is a good reason to not be here because you're doing the Lord's work. But how many times we didn't come here because I was tired, I don't feel like it, I'm not in the mood, I'm sad, I'm upset, I'm angry. And is really the Lord first by that. But the second thing about worship, it's not just worship as us coming here together, that is one form. But there's a personal worship that we have with the Lord. Do you and I give the Lord our best? Do we, do you and I, let me just say it, in a way that maybe is provocative and it, it is intentional. Do you and I give him the time of day? What do you mean? When was the last time you read in the Bible? And no, right now what we read doesn't count. On your own. And if that is not a daily thing, I want to challenge you, you don't give him a time of a day. When was the last time you or I prayed not about a need. Because he's the only one that we can go to with a need. And he's the only one that can actually help us with that need. And please go to him with your needs. But when was the last time you and I went to sit before him to actually pray? Because we want to be in his presence. And if that's not on the daily, you and I don't give him the time of day. I think the mind and the heart's like, oh, I love the Lord. But does our life show it? Is our life enabled? type of sacrifice, type of worship where God looks at it and says, I respect you of how you show up with me or I don't respect you, you're a king. Now Cain, God says, there's a way for you, but Cain chose not to take the way to make things right. God gave him an option to make things right. That is the first way, first thing of the faith and is I wanna challenge us to really worship the Lord practically what does that look like? Give Him your best. Give Him the time of day and also make the times that we have set together to come before Him a priority, not to come check off a box or I went to church, but a priority that we have come together to worship Him and we come in unity. The second lesson that we've learned that was in the night meeting, and I'll give you a, a summary of it, is Enoch. And in verse 5, it says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he had pleased God. And Enoch was quite a... Well, the lesson from Enoch that we learn is not a lesson of worship. The second lesson of actual practical faith is that he walked with God. And the word walked in the Greek means it's continuous and it's increasing. And sometimes we just walk with God whenever we, we have time. Hey Lord, you know, I got some downtime. Let's, uh, let's go walk in the park. And that's great. But how about on the daily? How about on the regular? How about continuously? Enoch walked with God. Now he didn't start out like that, by the way. He, first 65 years of his life, there's nothing to talk about. And at age 65, he, he had his first son, first kid. And his, he named him Methuselah. And the thing is, that's kind of, is that an old, you know, first time dad or is that a young 65? Old. It's old, right? And I had this one guy... 65 is not old, but a 65 year old, first time dad is kind of old. So having a newborn at age 65 is quite difficult. There was this one guy that I met and he came up to me, he says, man, I don't know what was wrong with me. I don't know what I was thinking. I said, what do you mean? He said, he says, I'm 50. I, mean, I can't remember if it was 50 or 55. I had a baby, like, what was I thinking? I can't get on my knees. And I'm hard. It's hard to do all of this. Like, what was I thinking? This guy was 65. But something happened, and he named his son Methuselah, which means man of the dart. 
And he says, I gotta make my life count because for the last 65 years, I have nothing to talk about. I wasted 65 years of my life. And then it says he started. When he got his son, he started to walk with God. But he says, I can't be one of those Sunday Christians. I gotta walk with God. I gotta walk continuously. And when I look back every year, it has to be what? Wow, I am, I've grown in my walk with God. Continuously and increasing in his walk with God. And he pleased God and God told him, by the way, you know, we've seen Abel worship God and it cost him his life. However, Enoch never died. So it doesn't mean that we're going to all be martyred and some won't see. And he's a representation symbol from a symbolism perspective. He rep represents the rapture when the Lord comes and takes us. Do you and I walk with God all the time? I love Elijah and Elisha. They said, The God before whom I stand. Not I stood, but I stand. I am in his presence right here and right now. And God told him, give him a promise. He says, hey, Enoch. And he's a pioneer. He says, Enoch, why don't you come up here with me? What do you mean, not die? No. But everybody dies, Lord. He says, yeah, I know. This is going to be a new thing of its kind. Would you do it? And he believed him. And what? One day, he says, why don't we just kind of continue this walk? And just come up here. No death. Just come up here. And then that's what the rapture is going to be like. No death. And the Lord can come any minute and take us with him. And he went with him. And my second ask about our, our life of faith. Do you and I always walk with the Lord? Do you and I have a continuous, growing, maturing relationship with the Lord? Let me say it a little bit differently. You know, it's... I can't believe it that we're already in November of 2023. I don't know if you feel like, it feels like we just started the year and the year is gonna be over. And you know, on New Year's Eve, many people, they like to, you know, take vows before the Lord, come to do resolutions before the Lord. But I'll ask it differently. When you and I reflect on 2023, do you and I have anything to show for it? Or do we look like the, the earlier Enoch for 65 years and there's nothing to show for it? Lord, I am the same right now as I was when the year started or worse yet. Lord, I am worse off. I am a weaker Christian right now than I was when I started this year. Or can you and I look and say, Lord, I'm so grateful for what you've done in my life this year. Lord, you've, you've matured me a lot. Lord, I've come to fall in love with you even more. That is the Enoch type faith. And the beauty of Enoch is once he started what? well at age 65, for 300 years, at age 365 is when the Lord took him, for 300 years he was consistent. Sometimes we start a program and then while we falls off. I'll tell you, for me, I many times, there's many diet programs I've started and they always end and I always get back to where I started. But he was continuous and he was successful all the time. You and I, do we have the faith of Enoch? Are you and I walking continuously and growing with God? The last one that we talked about last week on Sunday night and then I'll go to Abraham is Noah. And the faith of Noah is the faith. So faith that worships is able, but the good type of worship. A faith that walks with God is Enoch, but a continuous and a growing walk with God. The third faith is a faith that works, a faith that is alive, that is obvious, that you can see. And that's the faith of Noah. It says, by faith, Noah. And what does this look like? It looks like this. Being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Noah got a warning. God says, hey, Noah, uh, I'm going to do something. What are you going to do, God? I'm going to destroy all of humans off the face of this earth. What do you guys think? Has that ever been done before? Until that time? Until Noah? Never happened. And by the way, I'm going to do it through a flood. And Bible students, if you read Genesis chapter 2, they said there was never, until that point, never a storm, never even have rain. So can you imagine you tell someone, hey, I'm going to destroy this, 
all of humans essentially by drowning them and through rain and the storm and does that sound logical now if the ne if no never had a storm before never you don't even know what a storm is you don't even know what rain is and someone says because it says that god watered with a mist and so he's a pioneer he's like whoa you i, I don't know what this is lord but does he believe or not? It, does it sound scary? I'm going to destroy every human being. That's very scary. And who's saying that? God. Why? Because I'm angry with their sin. And there's a day that God is... By the way, Romans chapter 1, it says that God is what? He's angry. He's angry with mankind. And there's another day He's going to destroy, but not by flood. It's going to be by fire. And that is hell. So there's going to be a repeat of this. So Noah heard this, and what would be the initial response of anyone who's logical? They would what? Laugh at it. That's hilarious. Really, you're going to destroy all humans? Come on, dude. We've never seen such a thing. But look at all the evil. Yeah, the evil has been there year after year after year. There's nothing happened. There's no justice. That's what it looked like in Noah's days. And God says, no, I mean it. I'm going to destroy it. With what? Flood. What is that? That's hilarious. You've got to be kidding me. If you tell people about hell right now, what do people do? They start laughing at you. They're like, come on. That's insane. And by the way, Second Peter, read it. It, sa it says this is going to happen. So he predicted it in the last days. People will mock you up. Because you say, like, how long have we been around here? We've been around for 6,000 years. Now, if you're an evolution person, you know, you're going to believe the whole billions and billions and billions of years thing. 6,000 years. Come on. But what did he do? He believed it. Being warmly divined of things not yet seen, he what? Intellectually says, nah, this hit hard. I believe this, Lord. I believe that you will destroy humanity. However, I don't want to be destroyed. I want to be saved. So what did he do? Moved with godly fear. So he got the intellectual knowledge, the information saying this world is going to be destroyed. And he says, I don't want to be part of that. Or humanity, particularly because the world was still around. So he took it intellectually and he says, I'm going to do something with that and I'm going to take it and allow it to go into my heart, to sink in. And I believe it in my heart. So he was moved with what? Godly fear. And isn't this what happens to us sometimes? Sometimes we might hear a message and what? The information is like, wow, God, you're pointing at something. It's like, did, you, did someone tell someone about something? Have you ever had that happen? It happened to me many times. And then you're like, who, who told the pastor? No one. And then you hear something. You're like, I, I need to change that. Or I need to repent of that. Or I need to give this thing up. Maybe it's a relationship that doesn't honor the Lord. And then it goes here and sometimes that's the end of that. And then what happens? My heart gets hardened because I don't respond to it. But sometimes we're like, no, it hits here and there's this emotional response and there's a lot of people that do altar calls and sometimes they're the same ones. Every time there's an altar call, they come up with like, well, when was there ever a real change? Because it's an emotional response. It's not enough. It's important. It needs to hit our mind. It needs to hit our heart. But it needs to do an extra step. So what did he do? Prepared an ark for the saving of his household. I don't want to die like that. I want to be saved. But also, I want, I'm looking out for my family. And so I'm going to look out for them. I'm going to build an ark. Because that's what God said. As this salvation. You know who the ark represents, right? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm going to find safety in Jesus. In the ark. And that's what's going to save me from the wrath of God on this world. Because he believed God. What happened? He was saved and his family. Eight people 
on off the face of this whole planet, only eight people survived. But he prepared an ark. The ark is humongous. It's three levels. Can you imagine everybody that passed by would look, hey, what you doing? No. I'm building an ark. Excuse me, who is an ark? You know, it's, it's like a boat. A boat over here. You know, there isn't even a lake around, man. Not even the sea, like, shouldn't you, like, come on. That's more embarrassing than the Titanic. Oh, I'm building it. And day one, week one, and the thing keeps getting bigger. Month one, year one, in building, and everybody, I mean, he was the laughing stock of the town. But he didn't care because what? He knows that God's wrath is coming. Amen. You know, I heard this one example, and I'll move on, I promise. This one example that I really liked, um, there's a, an evangelist. His name is Ray Comfort, if you guys know him. Um, he's a... Uh, He's, he's really, his heart is for the lost and training people how to evangelize. And his son-in-law is actually one of my, my very, very good friends. So he was saying, you know, if you go to, he said, let me give you an example of what it looks like when we talk about salvation. He says, let's say you're on a plane and someone comes up to you and says, hey, this plane is going down. Here's a parachute. Gives you a parachute and says, take this parachute because it's going to make you feel good. So what do you do? You hear, oh my goodness, this plane is coming down. Well, the only way to be saved is once I start to see it coming down, well, I need a parachute. The parachute, you said this parachute is going to make me feel good. So what do you do? You take the parachute and you put it right on and you're like, oh, yeah, I feel good. And then? minute passes by, there isn't even turbulence. An hour passes by, there isn't even turbulence. And you're like, this thing doesn't make me feel good. I was sitting like this, now I'm sitting like that, because there's a big old backpack pushing me up. My back starts to hurt. I'm feeling hunched. And then people start looking at me, and they say, you look ridiculous. There's no... I know the guy said the plane is going down, but what evidence do you have that this plane is going down? It's going just fine. There isn't even a turbulence. There isn't even a little this. And so what do you do after a while? You're like, forget this. This is ridiculous. And you take that parachute off. And he says that's the problem with the wrong gospel. When we say, hey, come to Jesus, he'll make you feel good. And he says many people come to that gospel and many of them are not truly saved. He says, however, let's say you come and you say, this plane is going down. And this parachute is the only thing that will save your life. It's not about feeling good. If you have a problem, it's called gravity. And unless you have this thing, you're going to die. Now what do you do? You put that thing on and you don't care who laughs at you. You don't care about who mocks you, who ridicules you, because what? This plane is going down. And the only way you and I will be saved is what? Through that parachute. That's a very different message of salvation. Is Hey, you're a sinner. This world is going down. Hell is real. You can laugh about it, mock, mock it all you want. But the only way for you and I to be saved is what? In Jesus. Are you saved? today and are you sure about it that's the faith of Noah where he what he heard and he was convinced intellectually he believed but then what he took action and built an ark do you have a working faith are you an obvious Christian does everybody around you know that you're a Christian and a believer not because you say it and you're obnoxious about it, but because it's obvious. Um, the day before yesterday, I was in the clinic, and uh, one of the doctors came into the office I was working out of 
to, to get a cup of coffee. And then, you know, we were talking and then, you know, we looked at each other and he said, I was like, there's something, you know, about you to him. And we've known each other for a few months, you know, maybe a couple of years. And he's like, yeah, you. And then, and then we realized that we're both believers. And he, and then his, his, I, I said the same thing to him, but what he said to me, he says, you know, there was something about you, but now I have a name for it. It's called, we're in Christ. Are you and I believers? Do we, have we, do we take action? It is obvious, is it obvious in our life that we follow Jesus Christ? Or you're like, there's the people that you're like, no, that person's not a believer. And there's that person, that person's a believer. And there's like, ah, I hope they are. Their life is not obvious. It's question mark. I'm not sure. Do you and I take action? When you hear the Lord, do you believe it in your mind? And if you're convinced, does it go beyond that into the heart? And is there an emotional response? And then does that turn into the will? And there's actual action taken or not? Unless it goes to that third step, it goes in vain. And actually, it becomes dangerous because the heart becomes hardened as we don't respond to the Lord as He knocks at us time after time. Let me touch briefly on Abraham. And the lesson from Abraham, and he's mentioned a couple of times, and he's mentioned in 8, and then he comes back again to him. And then he talks about Sarah, and then he comes back to him at verse 17, the writer of Hebrews. And the lesson for Abraham, if I had to put it as one, what does that look like as we walk by faith? It is obedience. Obedience. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed. When he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And this is beautiful because you guys remember when the Lord called Abraham, where was he? Any ideas? Yeah, or or Mesopotamia, that region. He was there with his family. He was living a was he living a rough life or was it was he pretty comfortable? It was very comfortable. It was nice. It was like there was no problems. And everything was just dandy. Everything was great. And then God says, and what was Abraham worshiping back then, by the way? Idol Thank you. Idols. He was not a believer. And then one day. God says, hey, Abraham, you want to follow me? And he says, wow, yeah. I was following these dead idols. You're the real God. Yes, I'll follow you. He says, okay. I want you to leave your family and follow me. Now, what do you guys think about that? Is that comfortable? No. Was he having family problems? No. Did he love his family? Oh, yeah. He says, I want you to leave. Okay. Now, let's be real. How many of us is that, like, easy? Like, yeah, I'm ready to leave. We're not talking about, no, don't think, I don't know if you have some issues with your family. Don't think of that. Think of, you have, like, you love your family and you're so close and just very, very, very tight. Who would leave their family? Like, why would I do that? That doesn't make sense. It's like, okay, in our culture, Usually what happens is, you know, when uh, two people get married, it's now they're going to have their own separate, you know, unique nuclear family. That's not easy because, you know, the, the, the husband, you know, is really attached to their parents. Usually we have a very close, like, cultural, like, family relationship. And the wife is also attached to her family. It's like, well, who leaves whom and how do we, you know, and it gets kind of, it's a little bit complex. I know here in America, it's so like, what are you guys talking about? At age 18, it's like, bye-bye. <laughs> Very different for us. You, know, you don't leave the house until you're married. So he's like, Abraham, I want you to leave. Okay, God, I mean, I, I, I gave you my life. I left idols, and I'll follow you. I'll do anything for you. Okay, so I want you to go out to the place which you would receive it as an inheritance. What is that? Does that sound pretty good or not? I'm going to give you an inheritance. Good or bad? So he's going to be homeless or no? Is he going to be homeless? 
No, inheritance. And who's giving him the inheritance? God. What do you guys think of God's inheritance? Is it going to be better than anything we have? It's going to be really good. Right? God is rich. So, okay, that sounds great. Uh, and so he went out. Okay, Lord. <sighs> Ready. Where to? Not knowing where he was going. Never been done before. Someone follows God to what? To nowhere. <laughs> but he's promised what? An inheritance. He didn't know where he was going. He went out and he's like, Lord, where do I go to? Did he say Canaan? No, he just just follow me. Well, where am I going to? I'll let you know. It's on an as-needed basis. You know, think of, so veterans, right? We, where Veterans Day was yesterday and observed on Friday. And thank you to all those who served the country, our country. But there's some top secret missions where what? You're supposed to know on an as-needed basis. Right, brother? There's, you just thought, you, like, sometimes you're told the plan, like, okay, you're going to go to Iraq and we're going to, you know, attack. That's one time. It's like that. But sometimes there's something top secret that even, like, the highest officials will know just because you can't have information leak. That becomes an issue. He says, I want you to go. And I said, What's top secret, Lord? You said an inheritance. I don't know what it looks like. Can we do like the global thing where we look at it, see, look, see what it looks like? No. I'm not going to tell you where, but you're going somewhere. I just want you to follow me. Okay. So can I bring everybody? Can I bring pops and the whole family? No, just you and your wife. Okay. What are you going to give me? You'll know when you get there. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. This is not easy. Because it's saying, Lord, I trust you more than me. Lord, I trust to believe you and I am willing to be uncomfortable to not have the full picture drawn out, knowing that you've drawn it out, but I just, as you told me, what? Well, don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself, right? Sermon on the Mount. He says, but what? Your job is to honor me today. And I just want you to honor me today. I have tomorrow planned. It's perfect for you. With its ease and trial, with its good and difficulties all of it is perfect for you fitted but uh, but don't worry about tomorrow because guess what you're gonna have you're gonna land with anxiety it doesn't feel good i just need you to honor me today i need you to follow me today and i need you to obey me today this is not easy i want you to leave your family and i want you to go to a place that i will show you and i'll show you when I, on an as-needed basis. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise. Finally, he got there. As in a foreign country. The interesting thing is actually, he wasn't fully obedient. When he went out, you know who went out with him? His dad. And you know where they landed? Haran. Not in Canaan. And you know what happened? Dad got in the way. So you know what happened? God took away dad. And then, so if you read this, you read in, in Genesis 11, and then in Genesis 12, dad is now gone, and then he calls him to what? Now let's do this right. To the place that I've called you. You're not, I didn't call you to follow dad. I called you for your own ministry and your own walk. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise. But here's the weird thing, as in a what? Foreign country. So he got to the place. He looks at the place. And the place is good or not? It's really good. Was it empty? No. There was a lot of people there living in that place. 
<laughs> so he's going there and says, hey guys, just need you to know something. Uh, it's my inheritance. Love you, but get out. <laughs> Could he do that? No. Because these people, oh, by the way, how many people are there? Abraham, Sarah, does he have a kid yet? No kids. And then he's got Lot, you know, you know, who shouldn't have been with him. And he's got some, you know, people who serve with him. But he's not, he's not, he stands no chance. He's not a military trained guy. He's not going to go to war. And he's in this place that, what, he's not. He's like, what is this? It's like established people here with army, with, what is this? By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. He got there, there were people there, and he can't claim anything in that place because it wasn't God's timing. Dwelling in tents. So here he's dwelling in a tent. Now what do you guys think? Whenever you're laying somewhere and you're going to be, this is going to be home. Are you going to be wanting to live in a tent or what do you want to live in? A house. By the way, did Abraham ever buy anything in the promised land or no? Only the place to live in. Yes, so he bought one place which is called the grave and that's where he, when Sarah died, that's all he bought over there. But the rest of what, he lived in tents. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise. What's the same promise? This land is whose? It's yours. But do they own it? No. Are they living like they own it? They're still in tents. They don't have houses yet. Right? And he is living by faith. God's promise for Abraham was it an earthly promise when he says, go to the land that I will give you, like something tangible and earthly, or is it something that is um, like spiritual? When he says, go to the land that I will give you as an inheritance, is he talking something spiritual or is he talking about something tangible? Yeah. Tangible, a real land. Not like, oh, you know, this represents this. No, not, not symbolism, like an actual real land. But look at what Abraham looked at. It says, for he waited for what? Not a city, but for the city. But I love the word waited. He waited. Anyone here likes to wait? No. We get kind of, if you go to a yeah, fast food place, ooh. They take a little bit longer. You know, back in the days, they used to have, I don't know if you guys remember this, they used to have a timer if you go to fast food. And then if it goes beyond that, if you sit in the drive-thru longer than that, guess what do you do? You got free food. <laughs> That's yours. Because now, you know, there's some of them still have the timer, but they, <laughs> there's not fast food anymore. <laughs> Sometimes you can go to some of those, you know, In-N-Out and Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and you're going to be in some really long drive-thru. We don't like to wait. Abraham, until the day he died, did he ever own the land? No. How about Isaac? Did he ever own the land? No. How about Jacob? Did he ever own the land? No. These are the patriarchs. You know when they came to own the land? So I, Jacob goes, moves to Egypt because of the famine with Joseph. And then they, Moses, the year, 400 plus years later, comes and takes them out of the land. And then 40 years later, Joshua goes and takes them into the land. Now it's theirs. That's a lot of hundreds of years. They didn't see anything and it wasn't theirs. Yet he's living by faith. It's like, Lord, why? Why do you want me to leave my family? To lead me to a place that's not going to be mine till the day I die. It's still not going to be mine. So why don't I just live in Mesopotamia? Like, what's the big deal? I live in Mesopotamia. Isaac will live in Mesopotamia. Jacob will live in Mesopotamia. Then fine, you can have hey, Jacob go to Egypt. And then from there, we can go to this place. But why? Because it's God's will in his life. He says, but I want you to know, Abraham wasn't discouraged. Abraham wasn't upset. 
He actually says, Lord, I live for you. I follow you. I want everything in my life to be about you. But I'll tell you that I am also waiting for something else. For he waited for the city. I know your promise for me was earthly. But I'm not grabbing on to that. I want something spiritual. The city which has foundations. Does that sound like something good? If you have something with foundation. By the way, before I went to medicine, I wanted to be an architect. So I, I've drawn a, you know, a bunch of blueprints. I think three years in high school and, and a semester in college. So I, I'm familiar. I have actually some blueprints in my house. What do you think about the foundation? If you have a good foundation, is that good? If someone came, if, if we said, hey guys, you know, this church, the foundation is questionable. Who's coming next Sunday? <laughs> like, oh, let's meet outside. <laughs> you know, I don't want to, this thing could collapse on us, right? That'd be scared. But if someone says, hey, you know, this foundation was done right. You know, that one of the hospitals I worked at in my training, and they said it was made for earthquake. So it's on this the, the hallways and the whole building is built on this thing that if an earthquake happens, it actually can stretch and it can move. So sometimes the entrance could be in a different direction. But this structure is solid. It is made for California, for earthquakes. So he says, I want you to know I'm waiting for it. Not a city, the city. And this city has the foundations. It's solid. It's real. How do you know? What are you waiting for? I'll tell you though. You'll know what the city is that I'm waiting for. If I tell you a little bit about more the company that was hired to make the city. Who's builder? I'll tell you about the construction group. The builder. And maker. The architect. Is God. Is there anything more sure than that? Is there anything more solid, stronger than that? No. That's why I live my life, right? A song that we sing here many times is what? Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. He's solid. I know he promised me earthly things and he will deliver and I'll take it and I'll thank him for it. But that's not what I want to grab on to. This is temporary. I want the city. I want the foundations. I want him. The one who made it. The one who built it. He's the one that I want because he is for sure. And because I know he is for sure, guess what? I can obey him. I don't even think twice. I don't let it simmer in my brain. I just obey because who spoke? God and I trust him. You know what that's called? Living by faith. Pioneers of the faith. Let me go to Sarah and I'll stop there. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. You know what that means? Get pregnant. And she bore a child when she was past the age. How old was she? Nine. 90 when she had her child. So she was 89 when she got pregnant. Now what do you guys think? Is that past the age or not? <laughs> Some are saying way past. Right? Way past the age. Talk about, you know, Enoch. It's like, yeah, the guy was 65. That's not an old dad now. It's like, she's 90. That's an old mom. And then Abraham was what when Isaac came? 100. That's a really old dad. It's like, Enoch, man, you're, you're old news. 
When she was past age, you know, this is really important because sometimes people say, oh yeah, back then the things were different. No, they weren't still humans. There was no evolution, all right? The same thing, the same reproductive clock was the same Adam and Eve, just like it is today. So way past age, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age. Imagine, you know, God says, and he did this, by the way, he says, hey, Abraham, I promise you a kid. And this was at age 75. And Sarah was 65. Hey, I want to give you, I'm going to give you a child. And Abraham and Sarah both believed at that time. Now, what do you guys think about that? They believed, is she past the age at that moment in time or not? At the beginning of the time of the promise, it's too late. Like, it's a ridiculous promise. But did they believe? They did. So they waited a year. They tried for another. And then five passed, then 10, then 15, then 20, and then now it's 24 years. And then God says, oh yeah, by the way, you know that promise that I said. It's going to happen. It's going to happen now. Now who would make, who would start laughing? For real. 89 years old. I'm starting to laugh like this is funny. That's like, come on. And she did laugh. And it was a laugh of a little bit of lapse in her faith. La lack of belief. But then the Lord called her out on it. You guys remember she was hiding behind and listening. You know, he's dropping. And the Lord told Abraham, hey, where's Sarah? He says, you know, she's... He says, you guys are going to have children. She laughed and then he did... I didn't laugh. He's like, no, you laughed. I heard you. But then she still made it as one of the pioneers of the faith. How many people before her that we are aware of were ever pregnant past menopause? Zero. She had nobody to look to. Never happened before in history. And when God called her out on it, she realized, wait a minute, this is God. And her attitude changed, and that's why she made it here. And this is the beauty of God. Sometimes we have a lapse in faith. Amen. But God says, I'm not ashamed of you. And I'm not done with you. Will you change? Will you repent? Will you change your tune and your tone and come back to me and just trust me that I'm able? When she was past the age, because she judged him faithful. In my body, definitely not possible. And Abraham also, I mean, he's 99. This part of our life has been history for a little while. But I trust that you are faithful. Him faithful who had promised. You gave a promise, and I trust you, Lord. 89, not possible, but God. You see, the lesson of faith here is to walk, to live by faith is strength. There's this strength. When we have faith, there needs to be strength. And where do we get our strength from? It's trusting in Him that He is what? Faithful. Because he what? Promised. God, when he promises, he delivers. He is faithful. Many times, we don't keep our promises. It has never happened and will never happen that God does not keep a promise. Do you and I live the life of faith, the life that is strong before the Lord, the life that believes the Lord? Let me sum it up. Are you have, how is our life of faith going? Is our worship the type of worship that is from the heart, puts the Lord first, and He's number one? That's Abel. Is our life continuously walking with the Lord? Every moment is with Him, and we're growing as time passes by. That is Enoch. Is our walk, is the life of faith 
the one where we actually take action. It is alive. It shows by our works. People see God in our life. That is Noah. Is our life of faith so obvious and so trusting of the Lord that it shows up in obedience, even if He calls us to do something extremely uncomfortable, but He becomes first, even above our family? That's Abraham. Is our life of faith so obvious that it shows in what? We're not like a hope so type of person, but we walk with strength and confidence in Him. That is Sarah. Have you and I been living by faith lately? If not, how about it? Let's come today and say, Lord, I thank you because even though Sarah laughed, she changed that laughter and she believed that you're faithful. So Lord, I, I'm going to come and repent. I'm going to say, Lord, help me live out that life for you. Help me honor you from this day going forward. I invite us for an open time of prayer to respond to the word, to the word. And if he has spoken to you, just as many people that would encourage one another as we pray out loud.